So, thank the organizers for inviting me to be here today. It's really a great pleasure and a great honor for me to be back. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, it's a great pleasure and a great honor for me to be back here in the course. And thank you very much for coming. I know that you have been working really hard for the past weeks, and I'm very pleased that you make it today. So when I was thinking about the lecture, I was asking myself, where do we stand as epidemiologists, or more broadly as scientists, in a context of imperfect evidence base, massive scientific production, and highly permeated by conflicts of interest? So what are the new challenges we face, and what are the old challenges that we still have to overcome? This is what the lecture is about. In the first half, I want to present some of these challenges. And in the second part, I want to discuss some very exciting opportunities and solutions to address them. So more than 20 years ago, the Evidence-Based Medicine Working Group announced this new paradigm in which decisions would be informed by an integration of the best available research evidence, the needs and the values of patients, and also clinical expertise. And in parallel, the movement for the evidence-based uh, public health evolved, which applies similar principles at the community level. So as you can see, uh, in, in these proposals, research evidence is at the very core of decision making. And this places great responsibility in us as scientists, because we need the best available, the best possible evidence to make the best possible decisions for patients and communities. So let's discuss how we have been doing so far. This is a possible representation of the scientific methods, a diagram I adapted from a paper from Marcos Munafo. And I will use this diagram to help us navigate through the lecture. As you can see, this starts by generating and specifying hypotheses, designing and conducting the studies, collecting, analyzing the data, finally interpreting the results and publishing the results. So bearing that in mind, let's first discuss how we actually set the priorities on what we want to research. More than 20 years ago, Altman was already saying that we needed less research, better research, and research done for the right reasons. And in 2014, there was a series of papers in The Lancet discussing how to increase value of medical research. And in one of these papers, they were discussing how we should set priority on what we should be doing research on. And they say that research could be useful if it's useful to advance knowledge and maybe not have an immediate application by that time, or if research has an immediate application. And as an example of that, we could think of Marie Curie's work on radiation, which was basic research but very important, caused a revolution in medicine, or Richard Dawes' research, which had a, um, a very important immediate implication for the community. And we could also think about research that is basic research but has an immediate application as Louis Pasteur research on vaccines and pasteurization. On the other hand, if we are not advancing knowledge nor uh, producing something that has an immediate application, we are in the waste quadrant. And sadly, most of the published research today is here. Another important thing that the authors emphasize that we should consider is what's known. And it might seem obvious that we should consider what has been published in our field before we design or before we discuss our studies. However, we have consistent evidence that most studies are designed and conducted and discussed in isolation. As an example of that, less than 25% of previous randomized control trials were cited in RCTs published between 63 and 2004. And less than half of trial investigators were aware of relevant systematic reviews in their own field when they were designing their trials. This represents a big waste of resources and potentially results in, conduct, in the conduct of unethical and unnecessary studies. Now, moving on to talk a little bit about problems in designing and conducting study. We all know that the, the estimates that we got from our studies, they are a result of a real signal, a real effect that may or may not exist, but also bias and error. And I'm not discussing bias here, because I know you have been discussing that a lot in the previous weeks, and I know that by now you are aware that you could have completely spurious results in our research just because of bias. 
But I wanted to make the point that you could also have misleading results by inflating your effect. As an example of that, uh, it, there is several reports from industry-sponsored trials that one strategy that some pharmaceutical industries companies use to inflate their results is just to choose a bad comparison group. So if I'm testing a new drug and I compare my drug to placebo when there is an available treatment, this might be actually useless to know because I don't want to know if my drug, my new drug is better than nothing. I want to know if my new drug is better than what is currently available. At the same time, you could, for instance, give to your control group the current available treatment in very high doses, in doses that you could have side effects, and this would also make your new drug look better as well. And now I want to talk a few things about uh, analyzing the data. So when we think about scientific misconduct in data analysis, we often think about fraud and fraud meaning falsification or fabrication of data. And it's very true that one single uh, uh, fraudulent paper could have a very negative impact on society. A possible example of that is the famous paper published in 98 in The Lancet, implying a link between the MMR vaccine and autism. This paper was heavily criticized soon after published because of methodological limitations. It was retracted in 2010, and there is a work from a journalist for the BMJ showing that there is some indication that there was actually data falsification in the study. But despite all of them, this study is still heavily used by anti-vaccine movements to support their claims. However, even though one single paper could have a negative impact on society, we should be thinking about other forms of scientific misconduct that there might be more subtle, but they could have a much more detrimental impact just because they are so widespread. And we could think about several things, but I will focus here on some aspects about misusing p-values because this is one of the most common things that we see in the literature. Uh, this could come in several forms. This could just be like uh, errors in the statistic analysis. So as an example of that, this uh, paper analyzed 250 papers from the psychology literature, and they saw that 10% of the times, the p-values that were reported, they were incorrect, they were inconsistent with the test statistics. A very simple error, but very common. And what was more surprising about that is that even though this sounds like a genuine error, in 90% of the time, when it resulted in a changing conclusion because of the misreported p-value, these were always favoring the researchers' expectations. So even an error like that could actually be biased towards the researchers' hypothesis. Another example of that is what became known as data dredging and p-hacking. And data dredging or p-hacking is just a result from the desperate search to turn what became known as non-significant results to significant results. So as an example of that, imagine you are doing a lab experiment, you are testing a new treatment, you compare your treatment to another, to the control group, then you collect your data, you run your analysis, and then you have a p-value of 0.06. The researcher might be tempted, tempted to look back and think, oh, maybe there is an outlier and I should have excluded it, or maybe I should have transformed this variable, or if I'm doing some modeling, maybe I should remove or include an interaction term or a confounder. So whatever analytical reason is taken after seeing the results could actually be biased towards the researcher's expectations. So post hoc analysis is a, a kind of data dredging, and also something that is uh, very common is cherry picking. So we, we all know that by the nature of p-values, when you are making your conclusions based on p-values, you could have a low p-value just by the play of chance. And if you run several tests, it's even more likely that you get low p-values just because of chance. What many people are doing is to run multiple tests, just not correct for that, and only report the results that have a low p-value which is very misleading because it leads you to think that the researchers were testing that as their primary hypothesis. There was one German journalist that he, he wanted to take that to the limit. 
he wanted to know how far he could go with pee hacking. And what he did was to conduct a very small trial, 15 people. He divided these people in three groups. One group would go on a low-fat diet, the other group would go on a low-fat diet plus dark chocolate, and the third group would follow on their normal diet. And then he measured everything. He measured weight, he measured cholesterol, whatever he could get from these people. After conducting this trial, he ran all possible association tests, and just by the play of chance, probably, he found some significant results, including that the group in the dark chocolate diet lost more weight. Two weeks after that, he publishes a paper called Chocolate with High Cocoa Content as a Weight Ac Loss Accelerator. And the day after that, this is all over the media, a newspaper telling people that they should eat dark chocolate if they want to lose weight. Now, you might be thinking that this is an isolated case. The guy was challenging the system, and no system is perfect. Therefore, this should be happening in real life, because researchers, they, don't, they, they want to do the right thing, which is something I really believe in. However, many people have been analyzing the distribution of p-values across many different fields, and they found a very common pattern, which is to have an unusual high prevalence of p-values just below the conventional level of significance, which is 0.05. So you see very unnatural distribution here. This is actually a strong indication that researchers are doing p-hacking with their data. Well, so uh, now just to recap, uh, we were making the point that data analysis uh, can go wrong in many ways. I just gave a few examples of that. It's important to acknowledge that data analysis is not a purely objective process. It actually depends a lot on some choices that the investigators are making. And there is some a very interesting term that I heard from John Ioannidis saying that there is something called the vibration of effects which is all kinds of decisions and approaches that you could take in your analysis that for a single association test could give different results. In some cases, results will differ slightly, and in some cases, depending on your approach, you could get completely different results. And because of that, we need to be aware that all these decisions that are taken by the analysts can be very influential in the results. But then if we are talking that data analysis can be a subjective phenomenon, imagine now interpreting the data. Interpreting the data is even more subjective. And here I just plotted some comic representations of how researchers have been misinterpreting p-values. So you have something like highly significant, it's here, then it gets significant, then if it's 0.05, it's, oh my god, let's redo the calculations. And when it starts getting above 0.05, it's highly suggestive of significance, and then just let's perform subgroup analysis, and just a desperate chase for a p-value lower than 0.05. And this, of course, is not real, this is just a joke. But what is real is that there is a statistician in the King's College which compiled, who compiled 500 ways in which people misinterpret p-values. He, he took the time to do that, really. And here I just comp oh, sorry. Here I just compiled some of my favorite ones. So you have things like flirting with conventional levels of significance, or not absolutely significant, but very probably so. Or even like loosely significant. So it's all showing the same pattern. And what's important to mention here is that researchers are not doing that by chance, and researchers are not doing that because they are mean. They are just uh, responding, reacting to a reward system that is putting a lot of pressure on publishing what is perceived as sexy findings. And another thing that we have to acknowledge is that this is certainly a direct response to the current rewarding system, but we as humans, we have some cognitive biases, and we will tend to fool ourselves constantly because of that. So our brains evolved in the African savanna, where jumping to quick conclusions about food and about threats was actually a very useful thing for survival. 
However, in the 21st century science, this does not work. Spotting patterns, seeing structure on randomness can actually be a very dangerous thing. On the other hand, we have to acknowledge that some major advances in science occur because researchers could see and data in a new way, in creative ways, and John Snow work is an example of that. However, we have to be very careful so that we don't fool ourselves and try to see and start seeing structure in randomness. Uh, a scientific journalist in Nature did something very interesting. She summarized four, the four most common cognitive biases by which researchers fool themselves. And the first one of them is called hypothesis myopia. And hypothesis myopia is about collecting evidence to support your hypothesis and just ignoring all alternative explanations. The second one she called Texas sharpshooter, which is about seeing structure in randomness. And the reason why it's called Texas sharpshooter is because it's a reference to a bad shooter that just shoot random bullets in the wall. He spots the most dense cluster, draws a target around that, and then call his friends and show, look, I'm a very good shooter, so that's why. The third kind of cognitive bias is asymmetric attention. This is about giving a free pass to the results you expect, but being very rigorous and checking all the results that you don't expect. And this is actually something that happens very much with everyone. If you see something that you are not expecting, the first thing you think is like, I should have made a mistake. There's something wrong with my code. Whereas when you get the results you expected, you might be less prone to go back and check. You might believe it easily. And the fourth kind of bias is called just so storytelling, which is about finding stories after the fact to rationalize whatever the results turned out to be. And I think that sometimes in nappy papers, this is a lot to do with the discussion on biological plausibility in the results. Instead of discussing what is biological plausible, sometimes people just try to, to find out some biological mechanism, even if it's not the most, most plausible one, just to make sense of an association that they actually don't understand, don't understand and don't know what it means, really. So now I'll move on to talk about the final part of this cycle, which is publishing research. And I'm sure that most people here have heard about publication bias before. This is also known as file drawer bias, just because it refers to the fact that not all uh, conducted research is published, and most concerning, us usually the non-significant results, they have less chance of being published, it takes more time, and when you publish them, it's often in a lower impact journal. So there is a very strong selection, selection bias in the published literature. And to me, I think that this would be most stronger in top quality journals like Nature. If you just have something like no results, it's very hard that Nature will publish your paper. But if you have sexy findings, even if they are chance findings, you haven't have replicated, it might, it might be even more likely that you manage to publish them. Another very important uh, limitation of the published literature is competing interests. And when you talk about complete competing interests, we often think about financial competing interests. Uh, a recent example of that is what happened with Tamiflu. In about 2009, many people were discussing that Tamiflu could be useful to prevent serious complications of influenza, like pneumonia or hospitalization. And governments started to stock Tamiflu to prevent uh, problems with the pandemics. The UK government, for instance, spent half, billion, uh, half a billion dollars in Tamiflu. However, it became evident that many of the trials, actually most of the trials, were not published. And then the BMJ, the Cochrane, started a very strong pressure in the drug company to publish all the trials. After five years, they had access to this data. And when they did the systematic review, what they found was that, first, there was no consistent evidence that Tamiflu could prevent serious compli complications from influenza. Second, the trials that were first published, they were underestimating potential side effects of the drug. 
And lastly, there were no independent trials. So that means that the company was responsible, was the only responsible to assess its own product. Another uh, relevant example is with the food industry. There is quite a lot of evidence <coughs> sorry, showing that industry-sponsored systematic reviews on soft drink and obesity, they are much less likely to conclude that there is a positive association between consuming soda drinks and gaining weight. And a final and very well-known example is what happened with the tobacco industry. For decades, the tobacco industry tried to undermine and distort the emerging evidence showing that tobacco could have several detrimental health effects. However, even though financial competing interests are very relevant and have been well discussed, we also need to discuss non-financial conflicts of interest. There are several personal, religious, academic, uh, prof and many other reasons that could influence someone's judgment on research. In 2008, the Plus Medicine editors, they got together and they made a piece on that, on non-financial conflict conflicts of interest. And they uh, reported three examples of real situations in which someone's judgment could be impaired because of personal interests. So in a, if you are peer reviewing a study using cell lines from an aborted fetus, but you're morally opposed to fetal cell research, if you are an editor and you receive a paper from a former supervisor who which you have very good collaborations and very good relations, or you are one of the top malaria researchers and you are asked to review a paper of a direct competitor that might be even trying to disprove your hypothesis. So those are all examples in which you could be more rigorous or less rigorous when analyzing uh, the situation. And I personally think that non-financial conflicts of interest are one of the things that are driving up polarization in some fields. So you have fields that you have the believers and you have the non-believers. The believers and the non-believers, they don't talk to each other, they don't uh, discuss with each other, they don't try to uh, make the best sense of the current the available evidence, they just fit every uh, result that come into their own expectations. And the International Journal of Epidemiology did something very interesting about uh, salt and cardiometabolic diseases, uh, salt and blood pressure, I think. So they were trying to, they, they, had a, they published a polemic paper on the subject, and they were inviting comments from people that believe that salt is bad for you, and people that think that the evidence is not that strong. And it was actually very difficult to get uh, opinion from both sides because people just didn't want to discuss the subject. So what? As a result of that, the first thing that we have is that there is a big uh, compromise to the credibility of research. In 2005, Ioannidis published a very famous paper called Why Most Research Findings Are False in which he did some simple simulation to show that it's very likely that once you encounter a research finding, this is more likely to be false than to be true. And he listed some of the reasons, some he used in the simulation, some he just discussed that could be also potential reasons that could make the situation worse. And those are small study power, the two small uh, sample or small effect size, low prior probability of research finding being true, uh, high flexibility in study designs and analysis, high commercial and other kinds of conflicts of interest, and finally the competition by different teams. And as another result of that, we live now in a situation of a reproducibility crisis. There are many empirical examples where researchers try to replicate uh, drug, tra drug targets or papers in the psychology literature, and the vast majority of the results could not be replicated. In this survey conducted by Nature, 90% of the researchers agree that we, curr we currently live a reproducibility crisis. So what now? What could, be, what could we do about that? And what, have been, what people have been doing about that? So if there is one thing that we could do that would address the vast majority of these problems, that would be transparency for sure. A transparency can and should be promoted in several different ways. 
One important thing is about pre-registering study protocols. So if people tell you what they want to do and how they want to do it beforehand, before the study starts, you could really uh, reduce the problem with publication bias, in which studies go missing, and you could also reduce the problem with more subtle forms of publication bias, like selective reporting. For randomized control trials, this is actually a standard practice now. You have these two databases, the WHO one and the NIH one, in which people register their trials. And also now you have Prospero to register systematic review protocols, for instance. However, we should acknowledge that this is probably not a solution to every study design. If we think about a cohort study, for example, can we really expect that researchers will be able to list all research questions and all analysis they want to do before a cohort start? This is really not feasible. Things will happen when the study and the data already exist. So this is not a very good solution in this case. But we could still think about solutions that would at least help in the situation. And one potential solution would be to have a transparent and very comprehensive register of everything that the research, uh, the cohort has measured. At least we would know what is available. Another important solution that applies, in my view, to any uh, study design is to share the analytical code. If you know how a person conducted the analysis, then as an independent researcher, you can uh, judge if you think that the decisions the analyst took are reasonable. You can try to reproduce the analysis, and we can also learn from each other's code, which could be very beneficial for the scientific community. And now there are uh, just web-based repositories where people can uh, put their codes, and many people have been doing that. GitHub and GitLab are examples of that. Another really important thing when you think about transparency is disclosure. So, uh, as we talked before, financial conflicts of interest can be very, very serious to the public uh, and threat the credibility of science. Uh, Non-financial conflicts of interest as well. So, disclosing is the first start. And the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors gave a very interesting contribution, in my opinion, when they structured a document in which you can report all your conflicts of interest. And finally, another very important uh, aspect of transparency is sharing data. Sharing raw data is still not a very widespread practice, even though it's changing. UK Biobank is a good example of that. You can apply, if you are affiliated to any research institution, you can apply and have access to the data. Uh, and there was also a very interesting development a few weeks ago. The International Committee of Medical Journal Editors released a report saying that in the next couple of years, they will only accept to publish trials that have registered a data sharing plan when they register the protocol of the trial. So I think this could be a very interesting advance. Uh, just to summarize two initiatives that try to put all of this together, one of them is the Open Trials Initiative led by Ben Goldacre, in which they, when they created this database uh, to combine all available structured data and documents on clinical trials. So it can be very useful to have much more than the publication available and really be able to assess how the trial was done and if the results are reliable or not. And the other one is the open science framework in which you can create a profile for your project and you can add all sorts of, of information you want, data, code, whatever you think is relevant. And another aspect that is still about transparency is about reporting. You could conduct a very, very good study, but if you report this study poorly, it's just not useful. It's not useful for people to uh, judge if whether you did was good enough or not. It's not useful if they want to replicate your study, and it's not useful for people that are trying to do systematic reviews and meta-analysis and synthesizing all of this evidence if they can understand what you have done. Uh, and for some time now, uh, the Equator Network has been encouraging the use of these different reporting guidelines, uh, such as Consort, Stroh, Prisma, and so many others. 
And they are not meant to tell you what you should do, but they give you some guidance on the minimal set of information that you should report to make your research more transparent and more useful. And finally, the last set of alternatives that I would like to present is about publication. We know that publication is the research currency. So whatever we change in the publication process can be very influential. And what I think is very exciting that has been happening recently is that, in my view, the publication process is getting a lot more fluid than it used to be. As an example of that, now there are many things people have been doing before publishing, uh, now we have preprint servers like the bioarchives in which you can upload your paper before it goes to peer review. And this can have a very important impact when we think about disseminating the research. Uh, also, some of these servers allow uh, comments, so you could have some kind of prior publication assessment of research. Uh, in the publication stage, there are also interesting developments. Open access is certainly one of them. Uh, another thing that I heard recently, and I think this is a brilliant idea, is something that uh, BMC Psychology started to do. They launched a trial in which editors and reviewers will have to judge a paper only based on the research question and the methods. If the research, they will not see the results, it's a result blind review. So if the research question is relevant and the methods are sound, the paper is accepted. It doesn't matter what the results turned out to be. It could be very effective against publication bias. And another thing that uh, some people would argue if it's good or bad, but I think it's more positive than negative, is to do a non-anonymous peer review. There are some assessment of that showing that this improves the quality of the peer review, but could also bring some other problems. And another thing that is happening is what has been done after the publication of this study. So PubMed Commons is an example of a platform in which people are commenting and criticizing research that is already publishing. It's a way of thinking about a continuous assessment of research, which will evolve as knowledge evolves. And this is my final slide. What I want to say here is that I think it's crucial that we think that the solution First, the, the problem is not of, uh, is, there is no one to blame for this problem. It's, it's not about researchers only, about journals only, or about funders only. We are all part of the problem. And because of that, we should all be part of the solution. If we want to really address what is going on, uh, we should involve multiple stakeholders, researchers, journal, health professionals, universities, the community, and everyone everyone that can benefit from research. Another important aspect is that we promote teamwork. One of the main problems in the published literature is that studies are too underpowered to be useful. If people start to joining efforts, they can produce much better powered research. And genetic association studies are a very successful example of that. Not to mention that when you are working in a team, you can replicate results more easily, you can learn uh, more, you can work in a more interdisciplinary work uh, framework. Another important aspect is about uh, assessing what is going on, because many of these initiatives, they are very recent. Uh, it's hard to know if they will work or not. They might work, they might be ineffective, and they might even produce undesirable consequences. So assessing them and improving them is really key to uh, make them work. And a final aspect is that n I, I don't believe any of this can be useful if we don't try to change the rewarding system. We have to shift the incentives towards more reproducible research, more robust research, and not putting so much emphasis on having what is perceived today as sexy findings. And finally, I definitely believe that evidence-based medicine or public health is a goal that is very, very worth pursuing, but I think we are not there yet. However, I think all of these initiatives point in a direction that it's possible to change the cultures and the practice of research, and it's possible to overcome the situation. And I think that we, as early career researchers, we have a very important role to play. We are the people that are shaping the research agenda of the future. And in many ways, we are the ones that are most oppressed 
by the current rewarding system. So I do believe that we should come up, we should be aware of all of that, we should engage in this practice, and we should come up with our own solutions to address the problem. So this is what I wanted to talk to you. Thank you very much. And thank you for these people for helping me and giving me nice insights.